Joining us now from Capitol Hill, Democratic Senator from West Virginia, Senator Joe Manchin. Joe, great to have you on the show. Good to be back, Mika. How are you all? Oh, uh, pretty good. Uh, rapid fire here. Let's try and cover a wide sure. range of issues. Um, we'll start with the, the executive action and the immigration battle. You weren't uh, too much of a fan of the president's uh, executive action? No, the, the order I thought was smart what he did. He basically mirrored the bill that we passed in the Senate, which was bipartisan, overwhelmingly Republican Democrat. That was good. I just thought that basically he should have said, I heard the elections, the results were loud and clear. The Republicans will have a chance to repair or maybe pass something. Uh, this is my order. It'll go into effect April 1, 2015. I hope they do something before this yeah. needs to go in. And I give everybody a chance to look at it and knowing it was a good order. I, I don't necessarily disagree, but we're here now. What do you think the president's options are as Republicans are trying to figure out their next plan? They could pass a bill. They could also threat to, uh, threaten to shut down the government. I don't think they're going to shut down the government, uh, and I don't really think they're going to pass a bill now either. So no I think basically what we have is what we have. So then it sounds like the president had no choice, if that's what you think. Well, basically, I think that it would have been better for the president, after the resounding defeat that we were handed by the voters, to say, listen, come back in. You got until March or till April 1, 90 days, 120 days, whatever. But we didn't get a chance to see the order until the night it was that he announced it. And, and I understand that uh, the ire to that, and I know in West Virginia the people said, well, he's overstepped his boundaries, and mm. we can always say that a lot of presidents have done uh, similar things. The bottom line is we've got to fix immigration. You've got to secure the borders. Absolutely. We know that. And the bottom line, we had a good piece of legislation. I voted for it. The Republicans voted for it, 68 votes. We had four Republicans drafted. So he followed those lines. The bottom line is, give him a chance to act on it now with a new Congress coming in. Either the lame duck could have acted or the new Congress in two or three months. If they don't have intentions of doing anything, he has his order. It was well posted and go on with it. All right, Thomas. Senator, I want to talk to you about the uh, president's announcement to go ahead and what he's going to be doing on the Hill specifically, uh, boosting accountability for local law enforcement. It's a four-part plan. One of the biggest parts of this is coming for the financial ask from Congress and it's 75 million dollars over three years subsidizing the purchase of uh, 50,000 uh, body cameras that local police will wear. Do you think that Ferguson is the true catalyst that will get something like that done? Again this is just one part of the four-part plan yeah. uh, but this is the money ask. I know and, and uh, the, the bottom line what, what happened in Ferguson is horrific. Uh, no parent should ever have to bury one of their children. It's just horrible. So with all that being said, uh, we are a nation of, of laws, a rule of law, uh, uh, the best nation in the world for that. Uh, and basically every state, every community has to deal with their law enforcement. Uh, what I'd like to see is give me a comparison to other uh, areas of the country that are doing it well, where there might be a race, uh, disproportionate race uh, ratios uh, to where the policemen have integrated uh, and they're professionals and they have worked with it, the people trust them. Is there things being done that we can look at as models uh, rather than saying that we have to do everything from the federal government has to be driven by the federal government? That's the hard thing. And, uh, and, and I think with that being said, uh, cameras would have probably prevented us from being here today talking about that because it had been clear that what the facts were. Are you hearing back from your constituency about similar problems in police departments in West Virginia? Ferguson is, is not necessarily an outlier, is it? Yeah, not really, no. I think disproportionate all over the country from that standpoint. Even in our state that has the least diversity of most any state. But still yet, uh, I, I can tell you in our largest city in, in Charleston, West Virginia, the capital city, Mika, they're trying, they work with it, they're on bicycles, they're out in the communities, they're working with the people and the leaders of those communities. And you know, I've always said this, the police officer should be there and you look at it as someone that can, you can work with, you can talk with, and is there to protect you. They're trained professionals. Shouldn't be what color their skin is or what their nationalities. It's basically what their purpose and their professional training. And that's what it really should be, and we should be looking at it from that standpoint. When we have a breakdown such as they had in Ferguson, something went wrong. It just didn't happen when Michael Brown was shot. It basically happened long before that. How did it get to that point? Why can't we intervene before that comes to it? Why can't we have some indicators that basically the professional police officers and their leadership is not integrated with the community?
That should have been that should have been well defined. It was a huge gap. Um, yes. Senator Manchin, I know you're going to stay with us for our next segment. By the right. way, did you go home for Thanksgiving? Did you have a good I one? I did. I went when I went to my daughter's home uh, up in Swickley, Pennsylvania. They are up oh. there, and I have both my daughters and eight grandchildren, and we were all there and had a lot of turkey, oh. a lot of turkey. Okay, that sounds nice. You look like great. you've lost weight, though. I, I do. I feel good. I've been walking a lot. You know, I live on the boat, so I'm walking to the boat all the time. Is the so. boat out in the winter, too? Oh, yeah. I'm on the boat all the time. He has a houseboat <laughs> on the Potomac, I swear. Wow. You have to and come. You're invited, Mika. Can I, I know you said. You are. You and Joe, the whole gang, we're going to do a, a morning Joe uh, evening on the could boat. Could we do the show from the boat? Apps. Well, <laughs> that's my home. We could work something out. <laughs> it's your home? <laughs> that's my home. Was that a no? That was well, a no. No, that's, that's under negotiation. Okay, well, we'll talk about that because okay. I love, I, I've read about your bipartisan cocktail parties. Uh, I would we, like to be invited to one of these them. These are you neutral are going waters. To, uh, these are neutral waters. We're going to have you out. We yeah. go out in the middle of the Potomac, and that way nobody can jump or swim. They've got to talk. <laughs> <laughs> or you push them overboard. <laughs> Senator Manchin, stay with us for our next segment. We're going to take we'll you to North Dakota, the new Wild West for energy, and a place where coal mines can be turned back to nature preserves. Stay with us. We'll be North Dakota is ground zero for the nation's boom in energy independence. There's a lot of oil and coal in that ground, but it would be hard to notice some of those coal mines as one company in particular has figured out a way to return the land to nature. It is negative 17 degrees when the wind whips across the North Dakota plains. Great honey, it's cold. But in towns like Underwood, sub-zero temperatures are no match with the passion for hunting. Got one with the bow out here and it ended up in the lake. I had to swim out and actually get it out. It was pretty cold. <laughs> Mike Heidenen and John Bertolotto bring their sons with their bows and arrows to harvest deer here. But not long ago, on this spot, they were harvesting something very different. The Prairie Rose at Falkirk Mine uses this giant bucket to scoop away tons of dirt at a time, no matter what the temperature. What they're looking for is at least 80 feet below the Earth's surface, acres of coal. Giant dump trucks work 24 hours a day, carting 8 million tons of coal a year to heat homes as far away as Minnesota. There's a lot of wind energy today. You can feel it, can't you? Between coal, the Bakken oil field, natural gas, wind, and even hydroelectric, North Dakota is at the center of the nation's energy boom. Unemployment is less than 3%, and the growth is explosive. The president of Falkirk knows what people sometimes say about strip mining and what it might do to the environment. That's why he loves showing off this. After his crews carve out seams of coal deep underground, they work to transform the land back again. They return the topsoil and return the land to nature. Uh, God put this resource for, here for us to use, and uh, we take pride in putting it back the way it was or in better condition. This span of 700 acres was handed over to the government this summer. And this area does encompass a lot of those a lot of those treasures that we value highly in North Dakota. And already it's once again attracting hunters. Oh, look at that. Whoa. That's an eagle. And wildlife. I got two boys that love to hunt to watch them shoot their first deer with a bow. It's the best feeling you could ever ask for. I have a sense of pride uh, in the people that made this look the way it looks. To, to take and put these ravines back the way they were before and create uh, such a natural beauty that's going to be sustainable for generations to come. Now that's the way to do it. If you can bring nature back, that's awesome. Joining us now, the president of the Caterpillar Foundation, Michelle Sullivan. Caterpillar is the sponsor of our series and works closely with the mine company that you saw in that piece, by the way. And Senator Joe Manchin is still with us. Senator, um, let me start with you on the politics of this. Obviously, coal and energy policy played out as a major campaign issue in places like Kentucky and your state of West Virginia. How important is coal in the push toward energy independence? Well, it's, it's always been the largest factor we have. We're looking for a balance between the economy and the environment. 
Coal has been a base load. That base load means, uh, Mika, that's 24-7. You can count on your heat, you can count on your lights, and everything that gives you the comfort from electricity. There's only two sources, coal and nuclear power, that gives you 24-7 today. Gas is coming on strong, and it will be once we get the delivery and the pipelines done. But the bottom line is everything else is a complement to that. So for the next 30 or more years, even the Department of Energy says that we need the base load of coal. And mm -hmm. we can do it and do it better if the government will work with us and quit working against us. How uh, much? Oh, I've just got a um, graphic up here in terms of uh, coal mined by state. West Virginia, how much of the economy is on, in coal or other forms of energy sources? Well, you have a direct and indirect as far as our right. economy. I would say that we're more than 20, 25 or, or greater percentage of our economy, but basically it's the ancillary jobs, it's the machine shops, it's the battery shops, the cable shops, it's the little diner, it's the little cleaner, it's everything that goes with it depending on the revenue that comes from basically the sources of coal that we have. Yeah. And it energizes the country, basically. This is a global problem, and we keep looking at it as a North American climate problem. And unless you believe the ocean currents and wind currents start and stop in North America, we better find a global fix. That's going to be through technology, and that can be a whole other industry, especially for West Virginia and the United States of America. Absolutely. All right, so there we see the senator talking about a global fix. Let's talk about what we're seeing, Michelle, what Caterpillar is doing in North Dakota, specifically in the piece that we saw. This is Giving Tuesday. I think a lot of people are going to see this, uh, the hashtag on social media. So explain what Caterpillar is doing on Giving Tuesday. Right. This story is a perfect example and so appropriate on a day like today where it's all about giving back. We just got done with Black Friday, Cyber Monday. Oh, right. It's time Boy, to take a breather and personally reflect on how can we give back on a day like today. And we're encouraging people and educating them on how to give back. It's not just about giving money necessarily. What's your talent, your skill set, your passion, your compassion? Mm -hmm. And think about how you can give back and a, a lot of us get together and for your community's sake, start working in the communities with whatever is of interest to you. Think how the communities will benefit around the world. How have you galvanized uh, Caterpillar to do that and yourself? Right. Well, for Caterpillar, it's inherent. We've been, we have one of our values is commitment and it talks about we give back to the communities in which we serve. So for us, it's a daily piece our employees are encouraged and do give back both with their time in terms of organizations in the community both with their money in terms of united way etc so for us it's inherent in what we do and we definitely encourage others to join us and give back to the communities because at the end of the day that's what it's about what can we do for those who are less fortunate than what you can buy online or on it's a good Black time to Friday. Remind. It's a good day. Well, it's a good day too, and also a good time because you know you're you're in business, but it's also a good time to remind that business is in partnership. There can be private and and community relationships in giving back exactly. and making sure that those connective that connective tissue is there. That's right, and that was a perfect example of a public-private partnership yeah. that's working beautifully, and everybody is winning by giving the land back. Well, you personally have an amazing story, which I am going to be touching on in my book that we're working on. I'm interviewing you later today, and also there'll be something online. I can't wait to share <laughs> that with everybody. Uh, and Senator Joe Manchin, I'm waiting for my invitation to the houseboat. It's open. It it's is open. open. Hmm. You just have to find it. I don't know. It. That's, I mean, it floats. I don't know. I, I don't <laughs> think he, that's real buy-in on his part. No, no. You know you have my buy-in. You really do. Really? All right. Yeah. Well, you just we'll get it. We'll get the schedule. Because. <laughs> He's totally is it constantly moving, Senator? Is that Thomas, the is that the whole thing? Is it constantly totally on the move, and we just it. have to track you down? Yeah. No. You, this you is not going to happen. No, it, it, no. It'll be stationary, waiting for me and Joe and all the crew. There you go. Morning, Joe.